Rob Brown here with another episode of the Talent and Accounting Show. On behalf of Accounting Influencers, our global podcast, thrilled to have with you today an expert on training financial and accounting staff. It's Sean Purcell. Good day to you, sir. Hi there, Rob. Sean, great to have you. For people that haven't come across you in your world, tell us briefly what you do. Two strings to my bow, Rob. Uh, first one is I've been very interested in skills needed for future finance people going forward and uh, there's a term used quite a lot now called a finance business partner, which is a bit of a broad term, if I'm honest. Um, but I've been talking about uh, uh, finance business partnering competencies for probably about the last 10 years. Okay. I um, have written a lot of the CPD for all the uh, professional bodies, uh, AICPA uh, in the States, uh, CIMA, ACCA, uh, you know, those those professional bodies. Um, so you, if you've listened to any of that, you, you might be familiar from there. I also uh, help students prepare for the future of finance. And uh, I run a business that helps them, um, well, be a bit more skeptical and commercially astute uh, on, a, on a final case study paper for the ACCA. So I do a lot of work with uh, the HCCA on their education and examination department as well, which Got is it. kind of trying to prepare yeah. future finance people. To and when we look at finance as a term, it encompasses accountants and, and bookkeepers and CFOs and finance directors and all of this kind of thing. What kind of shape do you think finance and accounting is as a profession generally, Sean? Oh, well, I think there's a massive opportunity that they've been presented with as a result of automation um, of a lot of the transactional work. Um, but in order for them to seize that opportunity, I think there needs to be a bit of a shift in their competencies. Traditionally recruited for getting, you know, A stars in A level and degrees, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be able to communicate well with their workforce and, and gain their trust and empathize from their perspective. So I think, you know, the way that they're trained from my student side of things, you know, it's predominantly all about, you know, financial management, uh, accounting, uh, mathematics, which is all great. But a lot of that can be done by bots these days. Mm -hmm. And if that is done by bots, it frees up time that accountants don't need to spend churning the figures and they can use that time to get underneath the figures, which they will get underneath if they gain kind of trust and uh, insight from staff. And to do that, they need skills that a lot of them don't have. But they can all be learned. It's a what would you call it? You call it EQ rather than IQ. They're recruited for their IQ, but actually to do well in the future, they need better EQ, emotional intelligence. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And that message will resonate with our listeners and watchers on the show here because we know that accounting finance types technically brilliant. Socially, emotionally, communication-wise, we're talking about a a brand of soft skills leadership influence that starts to make the numbers come alive, gives them more credibility and influence in the business environment, in the industry environment, and even accountancy private practice serving business clients and entrepreneurs. They need to be doing more than creating spreadsheets and a historical look at the numbers. So just to unpack a little bit of those soft skills that are going to be required going forward, Sean. Well, I, I think you said it there, Rob, uh, to be um, influencing people, they, they've got to kind of believe in you. And if you talk a different language to the people who are providing you with insight and information, they're probably, you know, it takes a brave person to say, I don't get it. I always quote, quote that, uh, I don't know if you remember this a while back now, but Tom Hanks in the film Big, where he's a kid in an adult body. Yeah. And you know, kids are, are not afraid to say, I don't get it. But as an adult, we don't want to look stupid. So I think a lot of um, finance people, stakeholders, uh, don't, don't speak up because they don't want to look stupid and they just kind of wryly smile, but don't really know what's going on. And, and if we communicated to our marketing, sales, engineers and everything better, they might open up a bit more and give us insights into things that are, are going wrong that we don't realize are going wrong. So well, you're, uh, you're a fan of Matthew Syed and the book Black Box Thinking. I've read it too. And uh, for our listeners, watchers, just give us an overview of the premise of that book, Sean. 
Well, he basically looks at the health service and how it's a very closed shop culture where they never admit their mistakes. They kind of cover it up and these mistakes get perpetuated time and time again. And he compares that to the airline industry where they have got to almost zero accidents in the airline industry because they've been completely open and transparent with all their mistakes. And they put it out to all of their colleagues and say, look, made this mistake. How could we not do that again? Mm -hmm. So I just think it's quite a refreshing. I mean, you know, we accept everyone makes mistakes and uh, it's just how to minimize the likelihood of them occurring. And it brings in uh, kind of uh, understanding of how better communication. So a lot of doctors uh, I use a quote sometimes, my, my son, when he was a bit younger, is in the doctor, and the doctor goes, right then, um, you know, it wasn't very well, if you had any pain in your lower abdomen, and how regular have your bowel movements been? And, he, you know, he's talking to a, an eight-year-old in that kind of language, and you know, yeah. my son's like, you know, doesn't have a clue. Had he said, you know, um, have you, uh, you know, he kind of uh, says to him, have you got a pain in your tummy, and have you had a poo? He would have understood it, yeah. but he didn't talk that language. He talked about lower abdomen and bowel movements. Uh, and that's classic what a lot of finance people do uh, to their colleagues. And as a result, as I say, people don't want to say, oh, what, what was that last word? It's, it's a brave, self-assured person that says, I don't get it. Mm. We, are seeing a, a new, we are seeing a new breed of leaders come through that are, and maybe led by women getting more involved in leadership positions where they're okay being a little bit more vulnerable and okay to challenge and okay but women we know classifying them as a as a breeder are more empathetic they're more understanding they're more forgiving they're more relationship based rather than testosterone testosterone and role based so that's going to help isn't it we are in a time where there's a lot at stake we're post covid now there's a lot of talk on mental health and well-being and the great resignation. So these empathetic skills as a leader are coming to the fore. Yeah, but the good thing about it, we can't do much about our IQ. We're born with it. Right. And with good IQ, I think we get to about financial controller level. But the people who become CEOs and CFOs have much better developed emotional intelligence or EQ. So the good thing about empathy and these skills we've just been mentioning are, are they're learnable. Mm. So we can all acquire them. It's not so, I mean, you know, people say I'm a born salesman. Well, I kind of disagree with that. Sell, really good salespeople are really well trained and really practice the crafts needed to sell well and get them to, you know, optimum kind of impact. Selling is a dirty word, though, in accounting and finance, Sean, isn't it? They didn't do the qualifications yeah. to get no. into selling, but you're right. They've got to sell ideas. They've got to sell concepts. They've got to sell numbers. They've got to sell stories. They've got to promote action and decision making on the back of their analysis. Yeah, completely agree. And you're right. Um, I'm not sure it's a dirty word in the States so much. I mean, salespeople have a lot more respect in the States. So I do some work with some finance people in the States and, and, and they, you know, they respect sales. But certainly in the UK, you know, salespeople are just, you know, I don't know. They're just worried about what next company car they're going to get or something. Mm. And you know, the really important people are the people helping the business which are finance, which, you know, that's that's the thing I hear a bit, you know, the finance think they're a little bit better than all the other functions because yeah. you know, they're the most important. And that comes across, people can smell that. And you've got a foot in the accounting world with your qualifications and the training that you do. You've got a foot in the finance world. In mathematics terms, the Venn diagram of the, those overlapping, they are in integrally linked, aren't they, Sean? But just tell us a bit about that relationship. Um. Between just a bit more specific, Rob, but the, the, between the finance world and the the finance people and the accounting people, as an example, you wouldn't get many finance people without an accounting qualification, but it is increasingly happening that they haven't got it. So I'm just yeah. asking you to describe yeah. the, how those worlds overlap. Well, that's an interesting, a very good question, Rob, there, because if you look in the States, I did some research into the kind of fortune. I think I looked at about 100 Fortune 500 companies. And if you looked at who the CFOs were, a lot of them didn't come from the profession. Right. Uh, they came from like MBA backgrounds, not in the UK so much, but in the States. And I, I might be wrong, but I, I conclude that the profession doesn't encourage us to have these soft skills. We certainly don't get any training in it. We just have them by good fortune, but they are very trainable skills. And um, I think the future of the profession needs to worry because, you know, all this complex kind of corporate finance calculations can be done really easily with a bot. Mm. 
it, it, you know, it's, um, it's a skill we don't need going forward, but we definitely need to empathize, get under people's skin so they trust us and they can reveal things to us that we might not be able to see, you know, like engineers, salespeople, HR people. And if, if you give them a little bit of help on, on the financial impact of stuff, it's, uh, you know, it's, it opens people's eyes much more. I want to ask you how coachable accounting and finance professionals are uh, as a group. We know that they're very willing to learn because they've passed very rigorous qualifications to get where they are. But beyond that and beyond the, the CPD, the CPE, the technical updating of their skills, how good are they at learning the softer side of things that are required? Well, it's an interesting question as well. If I'm meeting like top, top CFOs of big companies, yeah. Obviously, to get time to be trained or get into discussion, those people are all ears and, and just there to listen. And whereas, you know, if I reach people a little, you know, maybe not quite the top of the tree, you know, they see not board members or whatever, but, you know, senior finance people, they often have a lot more to say and a lot less to listen, really. Mm. Uh, and they do it their way better. So, um yeah, it's an interesting, but the people who are CFOs are CFOs because they have those soft skills. They've had the ability to network, to empathize, to understand how to communicate. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting uh, how trainable are they? I think uh, from my student world, people really dislike uh, ambiguity. They love tax. They love the mathematics. It's binary, isn't it, Sean? It's black and yeah. white. It's right exactly. and wrong. Exactly. One on one is two, yeah. Whereas in the world of kind of strategic case analysis, one on one sometimes three and a half, sometimes it's one. And they're like, well, which one is it? Well, it's like, mm -hmm. who's best, Emirates or EasyJet? You know, who, who's best? Tell me who's best, who's best? There isn't a programmable answer there. They both adopt a strategy and a way of making profit in a different way. And they, they don't often appreciate that there is more than one way of doing things. What do you say to accounting and finance professionals that are very binary, as you say, and, and they see persuasion and influence as something of a dark art, manipulative, coercive, trying to get people around to your way of thinking with all kinds of cunning tricks and tools. Well, that is that is how some will see it. Um, and they see it, uh, they shouldn't see it that way, but they do. Um, you know, to influence people like that, I would say is not very ethical. Um, I'm talking about influencing people, uh, maybe with a few little tricks. There are lots of tricks you can learn from the worlds of sales training and, and psychology. Um, but it's not to use it in an unethical way. It's just to use it so you're on the wavelength of the person who you're, you're trying to influence. You, you, yeah. you know, you just, you're just ticking, ticking their boxes that they like ticked. I mean, in the same way, uh, I, I, I look, there's a great guy, there's a book, oh, what's he called? Uh, Nigel Risner, it's a zoo out there. Yes. Uh, basically, are you familiar with that book? Yeah, I, no, no, he, he basically takes Myers-Briggs, all the complex psychological profiles, and makes them a monkey, an elephant, a lion, and a dolphin. And we can all, you know, dolph uh, inquisitive monkey, you know, a roaring lion. And, and, and it's just, I just think using an analogy of, of a picture, people can relate to it, and basically makes Myers-Briggs a, a really uh, relatable kind of psychological evaluation of people. And it's not saying you must or you're a, a whatever. I mean, I see that with colors and these accountants tell me they're a type 2.156 and I'm a little bit of a, it's like, what? I mean, it's just kind of an indicator of what floats your boat. You know, do you, do you like, do you need me to get to facts and figures and be straight? Or do you like me to, you know, have a bit of a chat or uh, be a bit playful and a, a bit irrelevant? You, you know, so, yeah, it's understanding what makes people tick, I think, to get the most out of them. Well, let's be practical for a moment. You train people on the softer skills as well as some of the hard accounting qualifications. How would an accounting of financial type develop more empathy? What kind of things can they do or train to become more influential? Well, a thing I try to do, but I'm not always successful at achieving it, is when I'm talking to accountants, try to get non-accountants in on the training. Okay. So that they, like putting a mirror at them, so they can see, actually, this is how you come across. And, mm. and if I just tell about, oh, I don't do that. But if you've got an HR director and says, well, you do, yeah. because blah, 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 or engineers says, well, you've always done that, blah, blah, blah. And um, 
that really makes them wake up and take a, you know, it's about looking in the mirror and putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And, and if those people are actually there, I think it helps. What else is a good it. tip? What else is a good tip, Sean, for developing your influencing skills? Uh, be curious and read. You've got, you, you know, you can't, I get people that come on a course for two hours and they think, hey, I've got influence. It's like, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you know, you've got to practice it. You've got, you've got to get better at it. You've got to, you've got to eat humble pie and, and, and be kind of, I, I, you know, I'm not that good at it. Can you help me? Uh, which is not a common a trait to someone who I'm CFO and do as I say. Uh, I'm not saying all CFOs are like that, but you, you know, there's a way it's just simple psychological tricks. I mean, even as an accountant, I would say, uh, if you say, right, there's four of you out of 20 not given the budget yet. And everyone, or, or if someone says, look, there's only one given the budget in, what are you doing, you idiots? You know, get on with it. And then I kind of think, well, I don't feel so bad because there's 19 and others haven't given the budgets in at the moment. Whereas if you say, well, thanks a lot for uh, submitting your budgets, there's one or two people haven't done it, but if you could get on with it really quickly, we can really get it together. But all of those of you submitted, thanks a lot. And you're going to get far more kind of uh, uptake of submissions with that kind of wording than you are someone saying, what the hell are you doing? Get them to me as soon as you can. Mm. Um, and it's just like the way you word and communicate things can make a massive difference to how you're perceived and how quickly and you know how much effort people put into responding to you. And you're giving an example there, Sean, of a leader talking to his staff internally in a company or in a, a private practice. Financial and accounting people have external responsibilities, might be shareholders, might be business clients that they're serving in a practice, and they do want that bedside manner, for want of a better phrase, in being able to relate to them and speak their language, understand their problem. The problem sometimes is that they've got letters after the name, these accountants, finance people, they've got the qualifications, they are the advisor, they have all the answers, and they're not often programmed to ask questions and admit that there's areas that they don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem, I suppose, is from their training, they're, they're taught to balance everything. Right. And we've just said in the softer skills, well, you know, they're binary, as you said, but in the softer skills world, it doesn't always balance you know, there's there's a bit of rough edges that we have to accept uh, do occur and and, you know, just just roll with it kind of thing, I would say. Um, so in fairness to them, they, there's just, you know, an appreciation of this and to to see. I, I think I used an analogy we took, you know, if you can find the small fires burning in your organization and put them out, which you're more likely to find if you have a great relationship with all your team mm. that's far better for the business than i've seen this fire but i don't want to say anything about it because yeah. you will know you're really clever and, and actually i don't want to get told off so i just keep quiet and this little smoldering burning fire becomes a massive inferno that costs you millions of pounds all because you didn't have the conversation you didn't have the conversation because you weren't really very open to conversations because of your, your attitude and community. Oh, you weren't bold enough, Sean. There was too much at stake. You didn't want to put your head yeah. above the parapet, if you like, and expose yourself. Yeah, so it goes back to the black box thinking that we both like. You know, in that world of fine, even if you crash, it's like, look, I crashed, but let's see how we don't crash again. Mm. That's the mentality. Rather than cover it up and say the person was really ill because we don't want to get sued. Um, and there's been a big movement in the States. There's another good book, which is kind of, I don't know whether Matthew Syed read it first and then wrote his book called Crucial Conversations. And that's, a, again, it's kind of for medical staff in the States, how to communicate with people better and uh, how you're going to get much better outcomes. Because yeah. similarly, you know, I'm a chief, I'm the consultant, I know everything. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, I, I, some, well, it's, I don't know whether you want the story, but basically there's an operation, a person's going into anaphylactic shock. The nurse says to the consultant, very brave of the nurse. I think it's because you're wearing latex gloves. And I've seen this once before many years ago, it's a rubber allergy. And he says, don't be ridiculous. I've been doing this for 30 years and it's not, a, and the person's like gonna die. And the nurse says, look, well, if you would get the chief of the medical school just to confirm it isn't a rubber allergy, uh, I, I'm happy. And, and that takes a brave person who's a yeah. nurse, compared to a, you know, a superstar consultant surgeon. And actually that's exactly what was wrong with the patient. But the arrogance of the consultant because of them being seen as a God was, to not listen to the nurse who actually had something good to say. And it is having that 
boldness. But that speaks to culture as well, Sean, doesn't it? The organization you find yourself in and the culture that has been set there and a no blame culture where you are encouraged to speak up, you are encouraged to challenge, you're encouraged to be curious and push back. That's a healthy culture, but not everywhere has that. No, I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia and China. And, um, you know, if, if I'm talking to them and wanting, what do you think? Uh, I don't often, and I've learned, I've done it for 20, 30 years, and I've learned not to throw those questions out because um, people tell me that in some of their, you know, in some provinces in China, there's negative marking, say, in schools. So it's best not to say anything mm. and have a go and get a minus, because at least you break even by saying nothing. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a deeper culture, which people just need to, you know, be educated about that's not very healthy in the situations we're talking about. Yeah. Sean, as we draw to a close, what advice would you give, what advice would you give to leaders out there that want to model these soft skills that you're talking about? They want to set a good example. It's not just telling their team and their people to be more empathetic and be more curious. That doesn't work, but they can certainly model it and create a good example. What would you say to them? Uh, starting points would be if you wrote your own, rather than buy someone's course on finance for non-financial managers, if the finance team ran one of those and you start going through that people don't actually understand what debit or credit or accrual. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> There's uh, so many assumptions that they make though, isn't it, Sean, yeah. that people know I mean, their 10 language. 10 out of 100, you're a math ex math teacher, you know, what, ten, what percentage is 10 out of 100? They can't, they don't know that. And you yeah. think, are you an idiot? Well, no, I'm not an idiot. I've got skills in other areas, but I, I don't know percentages. And so if you did a finance for non-financial managers course, you would learn a lot about the language you use is maybe inappropriate. And then if you stood up and delivered it, People would see you're actually showing a bit of humility. You're showing a bit of empathy that maybe some of the financial jargon and terminology is, you know, not the capability of everyone. And I think that that, that would be a really good starting point because then people think actually, you know, he or she isn't that bad. Yeah. They, 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 and I would say that's a good starting point. And from there you can build it, but um, you've, you've got to kind of break through the, I am cleverer than you uh you, you know i am the finance god um it, it, we we provide information to uh help shareholders uh by having that attitude we can actually deny shareholders profits because we don't get under the skin of things and don't see commercial opportunities that probably our engineers our salespeople, whoever could help us make more money on yeah Sean, this has been great. We'll put your contact details, LinkedIn profile into our show notes so people can reach out to you. Just in closing, what gives you the most hope and excitement for the future? You mentioned earlier the opportunity that we stand on the threshold of in accounting and finance to really make a difference to the businesses and the clients that we serve. So what gives you most hope? Uh, well, I think I think the advantages in technology aren't a threat. They're an opportunity because they give us more time. When I was first a kind of, you know, an accountant, I used to spend three and a half weeks out of four doing month end. I mean, <laughs> some billion dollar companies now do it in a day or two. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can't quite believe my daughter, nothing to do with me, is, is now works for one of the big accountancy firms and was an auditor. And they do the same audit every year, but, it, it, you know, it, she's working till two in the morning with them, you, you know, every every day of the audit. It's like, surely you've done that before. And they, they just seem to repeat the same old things. And uh, anyway, uh, so the, the time that technology provides us with to actually step out of our finance funk. I mean, again, the other thing you shouldn't try not to do is sit with other finance people because they taught your language. You know, if you actually go and sit next to the people you're partnering with, you'll get that your language isn't really understood by everyone. Whereas if, if you just sit with a load of finance people, so yeah, they, they would be my, um, uh, the, the time is a massive opportunity. Finance, because people trust them with the numbers have been given a mandate. But if we don't, if we don't like deal with it appropriately, I think you're going to get MBA people who know enough about finance to take over that mantle. Um, so yeah, I think we just need to, it's pretty easy to do, sharpen up your soft skills. It will help you get under the skin of the business more because people will open up to you more. Sean Purcell, that's been really insightful and challenging. Thank you so much for your answers today. It's been great.